March 22nd uh, meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee, and tonight we are hosting um, the school department, uh, their presentation for their budget. Um, Dean, do you want to do introductions? Yeah, so um, a quick thought, I'll do introduction. So as, as we all know, the school department is the largest budget in the town. When you add in non-direct school expenditures, um, so the capital budget, pension costs that the people employees are covered by MTRB, things like that, it becomes, it's, it's a big number, right? It's a big number, which is why we invite the school administration in. We spend pretty much the whole night. We have a robust discussion. Um, and, you know, we, we tend to ask a lot of tough questions, but we, we're respectful the entire way. It's kind of like a marching thing, right? Um, to that end on respect, I'm gonna, I only share my one pet peeve. I know people around know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I do believe part of decorum is, is going referring to school leadership in a very formal tone. Right? I do call the town manager Sandy. I do not call the superintendent whatever her first name is. Because her name is Dr. Holman. Okay? First name is Dr. Lesley Holman. Um, and that's what I believe. Because I believe it, it, it maintains the stability of a topic that becomes quite passionate along the way. So if you, if you kind of indulge me, that would be um, a couple of administrative notes. I think that will come up in the budget. Um, to start with Mason, everybody probably been here for a while knows I have great fun confession for Mr. Mason. Um, Mr. Cooler also recognized that in the white town, which I thought was a great move, right? Um, Dr. Holman was like, yeah, we're not doing that, right? Um, so this year, Mr. Mason was elevated from the school CFO to an assistant superintendent overseeing finance administration. So that's kind of awesome, and that's great. I hope he's here for a really long time. Additionally, the school committee, who is also, I guess, you know, what's the old saying, you're broken bucket right twice a day. Um, they recognize that they picked a great superintendent. And so in the last couple of weeks, um, they finalized a five-year extension. Five years, a long, long extension, great with our current um, superintendent. And so hopefully she will be here. You know, they've got like, they do like five more of those. I think it gets her close to retirement age. Which is <laughs> so like, we can just keep the train running, everything will be good. Um, so that's about it. So without further ado, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you everybody. You know, I think for the first time in person, Dr. Elizabeth Owen, superintendent of schools, and Assistant Superintendent Michael Ace. Thank you. And with them, school committee members. Oh, yeah, them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who would you have? Kersey, Len, Paul, and Bill. They have first names. <laughs> Thank you so much. What an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. Um, and hi, everybody. I'm Liz Homan. It is wonderful to be here in person. This is quite a treat. Um, we did this all via Zoom last year, and so it's really nice to see faces. Um, and I'll hopefully be able to put a few more faces and names as we go along. I'm going to get us started, and then I will be handing it over to Mr. Mason to talk through some of the numbers with you. And then, of course, we'll take all of your questions and look forward to a discussion afterwards. Um, I want to begin by introducing some of the sort of foundations of the school department's budget proposal for this year and grounding it in some priorities. But of course, we always like to start with the kids. Uh, we are proud to put the students artwork on the front cover of the school department's budget last year and this year. And so here's some fabulous artwork from our Arlington young artists uh, gracing the cover of this year's uh, FY24 budget proposal. I want to begin a little, with a little bit of an overview of some of what we've been up to over the past year or so. Um, when I visited, when we visited you a year ago, we were talking about district level goals for that school year. In the meantime, or since then, we have engaged in a pretty comprehensive process with members of the school and town community to create a five year strategic plan for the school district that includes um, a new vision statement, mission statement, four strategic priorities that I'll talk about in a moment and three initiatives under each of those priority areas, some of which, of course, have costs associated with them in order for us to do some of the strategy that the community has told us they want us to engage in. Uh, we had a team of 60 plus uh, community members on the initial committee that developed the priorities, and then we had a smaller contingent of that group comprised mostly of family members of APS students and staff members in the system to develop the initiatives themselves and the action steps associated with them. And then 
we went through the exercise of associating dollar amounts with each of those initiatives so that we would have a five-year budget outlook as well associated with the strategic plan. So once we developed the um, plan itself, that budget impact outlook is helping us make some assumptions about what will guide our budget planning for the next five years. And it has guided a lot of the planning for the FY24 budget that you have before you. Um, so I wanna begin by sharing our vision and mission statement for the Arlington Public Schools. I'll, I'll not read these to you, but what I will highlight are some of the things that are particularly important to us as a school department as we began the school year and as we've thought about this budget. Um, really at the core of the vision is that we are striving for equity. Um, we are striving to be a community that really foregrounds equity and has it as the central spine of the plan itself, not as a separate initiative, but as the core of what we're trying to accomplish, making sure every single student and all students can access all of the resources that we provide uh, in the Arlington Public Schools. So central to that uh, vision is that all learners, that includes adults, will feel like they belong and that they will experience growth, which is sometimes uncomfortable, uh, but through experiencing growth and learning, they will also encounter joy and connection with their peers uh, and with their colleagues, which will empower them both to shape their own future and uh, contribute to their communities, which we know is one of the wonderful assets of Arlington is that we have such an engaged community and we want our students to be part of that into the future. The four strategic priorities are central to the goals that we will set every year and the initiatives and the action steps that will guide them. So we have four areas that we've used as sort of our guideposts for making decisions about budget. If it doesn't fit within the plan, then it doesn't fit within our budget priorities. So we really are trying to make sure that we are looking ahead at what's gonna get us towards that vision and what is aligned with the initiatives. If it's not aligned with the initiatives, then whether it's part of previous budgets or part of the new one, then maybe we need to exclude it. And so when we talk about the numbers, we'll highlight where there are efficiencies. Efficiencies are things that we think we can do without so that we can do some new things. Um, and we've been doing our best to be as transparent about those as we can. So our four priority areas, uh, the first one, ensuring equity and excellence, is really about teaching and learning for kids. Uh, the second one, valuing all staff, is about making sure that all of our staff feel included in the work that we do every day and that their expertise is able to be brought to the table and developed. The third one, um, improving infrastructure, operations, and sustainability, is about making sure that all of our teachers and staff have all that they need to do everything they need to do for students and that our facilities are up to date, modern, um, and inclusive for all of our kids. Um, and sustaining collaborative partnerships, number four, is about making sure that we have two-way dialogue with members of our community, we're taking feedback in, and we're adjusting our programming in accordance with whatever their needs are. So the uh, priorities and highlights that you'll see in the FY24 budget that you've likely seen in your review of our materials, um, we had several priorities that were guiding the decisions that we made about the budget this year. One is increasing enrollments at the secondary level. While our enrollments are leveling off at the elementary level, they are leveling off. They're not dropping significantly. Um, and they are increasing at the secondary level. And there are different licensure requirements for teachers at the secondary level versus at the elementary level, which means that as enrollments increase at the secondary level, we have to make sure we have the sections at the middle schools uh, and at the high school to accommodate the growing number of students at the secondary level. Uh, we want to make sure that we're ensuring equitable distribution of support staff at the elementary and secondary level. We've had an increase in English learners um, and students with special with IEPs with special needs at some of the elementary schools. So we adjust uh, staffing levels at those schools to make sure that we're accommodating the needs of those students. Uh, we want to expand the capacity of the system to address our achievement and opportunity gaps that's tied to that equity and excellence priority one on the previous slide. We're working on expanding our operational capacity in response to organizational growth. So as we gain students over the past several years, that puts additional strains on our central office employees and support staff and transportation um, and other needs that we then have to accommodate as well. Uh, we also need to staff the new Arlington High School building. That building came with a lot of programming expectations um, associated with it and new programs that are very exciting, but those new programs obviously require teachers to implement them um, and staffing to supervise them and obviously planning for the implementation of that five-year plan. So some of the things you'll see aligned with those priorities in the budget uh, are additional English learner teachers to match increased enrollment of English learners, students who are in the process of learning English and need to be brought up to fluency very quickly so that they can engage in grade level programming. 
um, an additional 0.5 special education team chair at the Gibbs uh, to reflect an increase in enrollment and IEPs at the sixth grade level. Additional elementary librarians in accordance with the five year uh, long range budget plan that the school committee developed several years ago, as well as in accordance with the new um, strategic plan that were worked on recently. Licensed elementary math interventionists. This is there's an efficiency associated with that uh, that Mr. Mason can speak to or I can later. More teachers, like I said, at the middle and high school level to support growing enrollment and additional operational staff in the business office, the AHS brand new beautiful auditorium, town and facilities, and a few other key areas. So with that, I will turn it over to Michael Mason, who will talk to you about a lot of numbers. Good evening again. Uh, finance committee members and those that are remote. I'm not sure how many of those are remote. Um, thank you for having us here tonight. So the, this, uh, I'm going to start off with talking about enrollment. And so what you'll see on, the, on this slide um, that you sent before, um, earlier before this, this meeting, is that there's a six years of actual enrollment and a five-year projection included, as well as compared against uh, a prior um, enrollment projection that was done in, uh, the last one was done in August, 2016 by um, McKibben. And that is what you'll see in the orange line, um, showing uh, enrollment, uh, enrollment trend that was increasing and then eventually gonna level off um, in the coming years or in the very near future, shall I say. And then you'll see that compared to our actual enrollment with uh, internal projection, which is the green dotted line, that green, that green dot line has a projection of uh, uh, using a weighted average, a five-year weighted average. Um, and that weighted average has been, it's actually a frozen snapshot of our projection, our, our trends that were, we were seeing prior to the pandemic. Um, that projection has been um, held pretty true um, in terms of you know, projecting our enrollment in terms of what we were ex are expecting for students. Then we also, um, due to the pandemic, we did contract out to another vendor uh, called Decision Insight, which is now Power Schools. Um, and they provided two different projections, a conservative and a moderate projection. Those are the purple and I would say greenish brown line that's up there. Um, I, may, I may be a little color disoriented, but um, that's what um, you'll see in those two projections the moderate projection shows a similar projection trend to the McKibben, but at a lower rate, not showing a recovery after the pandemic, per se. And um, you'll see that the, the conservative was actually showing something that is highly unrealistic and is not the tr trend that we've been seeing. Um, we'll go to the next slide and move forward to that. So this slide is the last five, the last four years of the revenue that we were receiving for the fund our operations for Arlington Public Schools. Uh, we received funding funds from several different sources. Uh, those sources include obviously the local taxpayers contributions, um, as well as um, grant funds. Um, some of those have grant funds over the years been COVID-19 COVID over the last COVID-19 related grants over the last few years. So that would be you know, ARPA, and then we have some ESSER related grants, uh, every student succeeds. Um, and that was tied to providing supports for COVID. Then we have our special revenue. Those are revenues that we receive for tuitions that we charge maybe for our preschool students, um, and as well as renting out spaces and uh, any services that we may provide to the community that we are collecting fees for. And and then we also break out the local kind of the town appropriation in two categories, which just kind of give you a comparison of between what the actual local contribution is from the taxpayers in Arlington and the um, chapter 70 state aid, which is a formula that it provides equitable funding across the state. So as you'll see is that the town appropriation is the largest portion of our budget. Um, which is what we come to seek support or from the town every year to support our students. Um, and that, that includes that it's part of the long range planning formula. And so of that formula, there's different various revenue sources that funds the town's budget 
which includes the chapter 70 state aid. Um, and then obviously the, the local contribution that the taxpayers have. And then there are very small portions, circuit breaker, which is a reimbursement that we receive, the town receives for special education at a district tuition, which is, you know, when we have, uh, when we send students to outside schools for services that we cannot provide, uh, we get reimbursed um, when they pass a certain threshold. Um, and as well as I spoke to the grants and special uh, special revenue before. <clears throat> that same pie is then when we're looking at when we're developing our budget is split up, and um, and it's split up into uh, six budget transfer categories, um, and as well grants. And so those budget transfer categories include administration costs, that's cost to lead and run the district, curriculum instruction, support the instruction that's happening in the classrooms, secondary and elementary education, which is based on the grade levels that are supporting the general education population, and then special education, which supports throughout the continuum, and even out the students that are, are receiving support at outside schools. And you'll see that Elementary and secondary education in this proposed budget is pretty even in terms of how we're funding it. It's about 27.27%. And then special education is another 25%. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, and so this breaks down what our, our total, how our total budget comes to the, the total number this for this year, the operating budget. So our total budget is going to be about $96 million. Um, once again, this excludes capital spending. This is just the school committee uh, controlled funding. Um, and so $88.9 million we're expecting to receive from the town appropriation. And so, and we wanted to, to, to point out that, you know, this year we're seeing a substantial increase in chapter 70 state aid on the town side. Um, we don't necessarily directly receive those funds, but it's Part of the funding formula and part of the calculation of giving us, us that 88.9 million dollars and that big jump that we're seeing this year is tied to enrollment growth but as well as the the continued implementation of the student opportunity act at the state level um then we also we level fund our grants it's hard to predict what the grants will be in the in the upcoming year um so is the best that the conservative, usually they do grow very slightly, um, but not, not as much as to grow to the, the, to the, to the, the rate of inflation. So um, we'll get an update in the summer and we typically go back to the school committee and provide those updates. Um, but in our proposed budget, they're level funded. And then we separated out the COVID related grants. So we are carrying over ESSER three, which is part of the ARPA funding um, we got about $1.3 million, $1 million in ESSER-3 uh, related funds, and we're going to carry about $900,000 over, which will explain how we're anticipating to use those funds and to spend the last remaining year. We do have to spend it before next fiscal year is over. And then we are anticipating to use about 26% more in our special revenue funds. Um, we're not necessarily meaning we're increasing fees at that rate. Um, it means that we are upticking some of our spending and our, some of our, uh, our balances. And then um, circuit breaker is actually, has we seen a reducing revenue and you'll see that our out of district tuition, which is what's direct reimbursement to tuition, out of district tuition and transportation, since has, that has gone down, we're gonna see that revenue source go down. Um, so overall, we're going to see about a $4.9 million increase year over year from our prior year budget that we're currently at. So overall, I'm just give you a, a, like a high level summary before I hand it over back to Dr. Holman to explain some of what, what we're going to do with our additional funds. But um, overall, we have about, including the ESSER 3 spent uh, additional funds, we have about $5.4 million that we're factoring for a budget increase. <laughs> um, when you factor in, when you, after you take out contractual obligations, things that we've already negotiated that we are obligated once we're subject to appropriation, we have about 2.4 million that we have to pay right off the top. Yeah. After that, um, we're anticipating 
this year, um, the state has released the rates already for fiscal 24 for out of district placement. Based on our anticipated enrollment, um, we're, see, we're expected, rates are expected to go up or they are going to go up by 14%. Um, by, um, that was set by the, the uh, Operating Services Division of the state. And we also are expecting to see utility increases. Um, the new high school operates efficiently, but there's a lot more services, like a lot more equipment that's being used. Um, and so, and this doesn't take account that we're, we're seeing a large impact to our budget this year, but we're expecting the new contracted rates to actually come in. So right now we're paying market rates for the current high school building project, our high school building, and we will be locking in a newer rate that is not as advantageous as the prior rate to the old buildings. Um, that's actually a 30% cost increase. Um, department budget adjustments are basically department heads, principals, school leaders, we part of the budget process. They come, they identify, hey, here's the things that we'd like to spend on. And you know what we're able to accommodate in this budget is about 585,000 for their discretionary spending and their budgets to support direct instruction to students and to provide um, supplies and materials to the teachers. And that leaves uh, uh, us after taking out about reviewing positions and looking at what we do not need or what we possibly can do without, um, we take about $1.1 million to leave us with $2.8 million for proposed additions for the fiscal 24 budget. I'll hand it over to Dr. Holman if she wants to okay. talk about the budget analysis. Sure. So listed here, and we're happy to answer questions about any individual ones of these, but I'm not going to read through each of the next several charts. I'm just to pull out a few highlights, and then we can go into more detail as you all have curiosity about any of them. But this is a list of the efficiencies. These are essentially things that might have come out of the budget this year. Some of them are in order to restructure. So as an example of that, uh, the communications director grants in Title I um, is a role that a lot of different tasks have been sort of consolidated into a single role. Uh, we don't have a communications department in the school department. Um, we have sort of that sort of lumped in with grants and uh, grants in Title I uh, management right now. And so part of the strategic plan is to create a welcome center for families uh, that will also address some of the needs of our growing English learner population, allow for increased availability of translations and interpretation services for families, um, and it breaks that communications uh, and grants roles into two separate roles. And so that's an efficiency because it comes out of the budget in order to create the additional two. So what you will see here is that there are things listed here as efficiencies that allow us to then reallocate those funds towards something maybe a little bit more strategic. Um, the math intervention paraprofessionals is another example. We've been trying to work towards having more licensed professionals doing intervention work with students. Um, in, in other words, having a licensed interventionist who is licensed in mathematics, working with students who might need additional support in mathematics as opposed to a paraprofessional who wouldn't necessarily be licensed. So that comes at an additional salary cost, but we can offset that by eliminating the paraprofessional and adding the uh, licensed professional. We've done a, sim a similar thing with special education um, over the last couple of years, where maybe in order to provide service delivery, it would be more advantageous for us to have a licensed special educator in the, in the classroom, as opposed to a couple of paraprofessionals who can provide additional help and support, but it'd be, it'd be better to have an additional licensed professional in the building. So there are a couple of other uh, paraprofessional roles like the library paraprofessionals that are going towards including a licensed professional uh, in one of the schools. So that explains some of these budget efficiencies. Um, I'm going to walk through additions by level. Uh, at the high school, we are proposing some increases to classroom teachers to accommodate additional enrollment and section requirements in several uh, dis different disciplinary areas. A theater manager, which is common for districts that have a theater a, like the beautiful one that we have at the new high school. Uh, this role will both do some student facing work to sort of help students run and manage the theater, as well as allow us to uh, actually rent that space out or use it with the community or other community organizations to make that a highly utilized space for the entire community. Uh, the new high school also comes with a cafe in the sort of main core area and a smart lab, sort of a copy center that the district can use to um, 
consolidate and copy costs and printing costs and do some of our own printing in house. Those two spaces need to be staffed. Um, so we're beginning our work towards that with some 0.5 staffing of those two roles. Uh, it's some additional special education reading support and paraprofessional support as well for the high school. Um, at the middle school level, we are really trying to um, accommodate some of the expanding enrollments as some bigger classes move into Audison Middle School. Uh, we have an, also an increasing number of English learners at the middle school, many of whom are moving in at a level one, which essentially means that they don't have any English um, proficiency. And so they're coming in and we're teaching them English from the outset. And that requires some additional staffing to accommodate those students' needs. Uh, we have done a lot of work over the past couple of years to expand the LCs at the Audison. So we now have the number of sort of core area classroom teachers that we need with five LCs in each of the two grade levels at the Audison. Um, but what we didn't do in those expansions over the past couple of years is add the teachers in facts and some of the elective courses. And so those course classes have gotten very large, um, over 25 students in some cases, if the classes are not balanced because of schedule constraints and student services, sometimes those classes will be upwards of like 30 and 35 students. So we want to bring that down as much as we can. Um, and an addition, additional team chair as well to accommodate students with IEPs. Um, so at the elementary preschool and elementary school levels, um, we have a SLC or a, a supported learning community that's moving from Bracket to Hardy. Um, that is actually offset by an efficiency in another part of the budget, uh, but that's a teacher that's just relocating. Uh, we need an additional English learner teacher at the Pierce as well as in special education liaison um, we are also doing the math interventionist adjustment at Pierce and Stratton. We did it at Bishop and another school last year, but I'm not remembering which one. Um, so that will get us to uh, licensed math interventionists at every school, which is very exciting. Um, the uh, instrumental music teachers is an expansion in response to significantly expanded enrollment in instrumental music. After last year, we eliminated the fees for instrumental music at the elementary level, and we have more kids who want to play music, which is fantastic. Uh, but we also then need to accommodate the students who would like to participate in that program. Um, and we're adding two uh, librarians, which I noted, one of which is offset by elimination of two library paraprofessionals in the budget. And then at the district level, we are doing a number of adjustments this year, some of which I spoke to a moment ago. Um, this curriculum specialist one is just a change of title. It's an offset. There was a, an efficiency associated with that one as well. Uh, the communication specialist, like I said, uh, that one actually, I believe the specialist is on um, ESSER, correct? Uh, and the director, though, is on the general fund budget. So this is the one that is the breakout, this and the grant administrator of that uh, role that is currently consolidated into one role. Um, the building systems manager is to aid uh, all of us townwide. It's gonna be stationed at the high school to sort of ensure that the systems in that new building are tweaked and working efficiently and that all of our automated building systems like HVAC systems and electric systems are um, running efficiently but will also be something that is shared with the entire facilities department to ensure that all buildings across the Arlington Public Schools and in the town are running efficiently. Um, we need it at the high school. It was built into the, some of the assumptions about the high school project, uh, and it's you know, going to also help out facilities on the town side um, to have that role in place as well. And then we have some reserve positions in order to ensure that in the event we were to have some any surprises with enrollment or needed to make any adjustments to section sizes at the elementary level that we would have the capacity to do that. Um, a few ESSER additions. This is how we're going to be planning on using some of the ESSER funds that are still there that we need to use up by the end of the year. We're using these funds to move forward on some of the strategic priorities we have but that we couldn't make room for in the general fund budget. Um, that is to add some diversity, belonging, and inclusion specialists to help with professional development tied to the strategic plan, uh, family and school transition liaison. This is something that we think every single school should have as part of their core programming, but we don't have any at the moment. So because Gibbs in particular is a school where students go through multiple transitions, they go into sixth and then out of sixth into seventh. Um, we are hoping to pilot a transition liaison role there to aid in those transitions and coordinate some work um, over the summers and with families, because that involves a lot of meetings and a lot of handoffs. We want that to go as smoothly as possible. 
Um, we're adding a director of high school counseling to do some specific mental health and counseling support at the high school. Uh, this is a role that would allow for more capacity for the deans also to aid in some of the instructional leadership work that's going on at the high school and is something that um, will also allow for some scheduling and 504 coordination to be housed in a single place, which has been sort of spread out across the high school. And uh, the communication specialist is here now, so it's in two spots. Oh, it, that was, that was it, yeah, there's an error on the previous slide. It belongs here. This is correct. Um, and we launched instructional leadership teams in partnership with the Arlington Education Foundation last year. Um, and they provided a lot of dollars for stipends so that we could expand shared leadership across the schools and have more leadership teams that teachers were involved in so that they could help do decision making around programming for students. And that's been very successful and um, very impactful for some of the work we're doing in the schools. And we need, want to continue to increase some of that teacher leadership across the system. And so we're going to use ESTA dollars to continue doing that um, as the AEF funds expire. Um, and then there are some other one-time projects that we're anticipating using ESSER for that are in the strategic plan linked to infrastructure and making sure that our HVAC is up to date um, and we're still working on exactly what which projects we will use uh, that for. So a timeline, uh, we are here with you tonight. So we are here and we're looking forward to the discussion and to visiting town meeting later on this year. And we're happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. All right. So, um, questions, Annie? Um, yeah. So, if we could go back really quick from like to slide 10 in the presentation. Yep. Um, I'm, I think we talked to, and I'm sorry, I should have said Mr. Mason. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think we talked about this last year, but I just want to double check that when you say grants on this slide, what you really mean is grant expenses? Yes. This is the outgo. Do the grant expenses match the grant dollars? In terms of the revenue that we're receiving? Yeah, in other words, can you isolate those expenses and say, yeah, these things are grant funded. If the grants went away, these are activities we would no longer do, or is mm -hmm. it more mixed in with other things than that? So one of the, like, so these grants are entitlement grants mm -hmm. that are unlike, highly unlikely to go away. Okay. Um, these grants include funding such as IDEA, um, which is mainly for special education. That's the largest portion of this. Um, but yes, if, if the funds went away, we would have to either have hard conversations about how we would go forward in terms of providing those services if they are still desired and required or eliminate roles or whatever resources that were tied to those, those grants. So those are the isolated grants that specifically for for those grant related purposes. So right. I'm Title I, IDEA, Title II, Title III. All right. All those. And we're doing fund accounting to prove that those activities match what the grants are. Correct. Mm -hmm. And we do we, we do time and attend, um, time and effort certification so to ensure that everybody who's on those grants are actually provided those services. Providing those services. Okay. Um, Can I just add the, um, the federal grants are subject to an annual audit by Powers and Sullivan? Yes, I assume so, but sometimes I ask questions so that everybody has know, just... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, bad habit. Um, so then I just want to say a couple of other things about the budget. First of all, I love any budget where we talk about the budget funding priorities and values. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate that that's how you structured this conversation. It's uh, a little new. Um, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> And I'm really excited to see librarians coming back. I haven't been traumatized by the removal of librarians from my kids' grants yet. But could you tell me, um, so you're putting back two elementary librarians. Are they splitting schools again? And how are we covering all? So this is um, the two, the addition of two is actually to accommodate a pilot of a full-time librarian in two of our schools where we had the capacity to eliminate a paraprofessional role at that school and put a fully licensed librarian in that school. The hope being that in another year, we might actually be able to return to full-time licensed librarians at all of our elementary schools. And that maybe in another year, we would have full-time licensed librarians at our two middle schools as well. That's currently split. Um, there's one librarian for the two middle schools. The model um, that, and I'm happy to speak to this more, folks are wondering that we would like to get to is to have a fully licensed librarian at every single school. 
um, splitting that particular tier one sort of core resource across schools means that on any given day, you may or may not have a librarian at the school to provide services to students. Um, so what we'd like to get to is a fully licensed librarian and paraprofessionals that are shared to help with uh, cataloging, um, shelving, weeding, some of the sort of tasks that go along with the library, but are not instructional tasks, like knowing which books to put on the shelves, for example. So that's what we're working towards. And so the elimination of paraprofessionals works because it gets us closer to sharing the paraprofessionals across schools. Got it. So which schools are in the five? Pearson Stratton will be the first two. I'm going to stop smiling now. <laughs> <laughs> um, other than that, I, I this looks great. This is a, a budget I can understand. Thank you. Other questions? Rebecca. Um, I had a question. Thank you. I had a question um, about uh, special education out of district. So if I'm looking at page 106, uh, just for people who want to follow along. Um, this is my first year on the finance committee, by the way, so maybe there's a history to this that I don't know. If I look at that out of district residential spending from the actual spending from fiscal year, what was that 2020? Mm -hmm. It was all the way at 1.3 million, and now we're down to 104,000, which seems miraculous and like miraculous. sort of too good to be true. So, do we? What's the explanation for that? Because I'm just used to thinking special education just goes up so quickly and where we have out of district is basically flat and residential is down so nine percent. Like that's great if that's yeah, what, re, re, yeah, like out of district tuition varies based on the needs of the students and yeah. the, who what students that we have at that particular time. Yeah. And um I will say that as working closely uh, with the assistant superintendent of student services, you know, they do have a comprehensive tracking system where, you know, they have an understanding of the current students that we have. Um, but sometimes the students come in and we're not expecting those students or they have a, all of a sudden need the services. And so that's why you might see that discrepancy because the residential services are not necessarily as consistent, but that's that's also why the formula in the long range plan, I believe, is established a certain way because there's been this unpredictability in the out of district special education spending. Um, and so um, that would be the simplest way that I could explain this. Um, I hope I answered your question. So I, I realize, of course, we're not going to talk about individual kids, but is the suggestion that basically like those children out the Arlington Public Schools or something? Or would be... they, they could have outgrown and the Arlington Public School District, they could have moved and are no longer in Arlington Public School District. Um, they could have no longer needed that particular service and get, getting a different type of service that might not be as expensive. But. So we have strategy-wise, and I think this graph, which was not in our presentation, but is helpful for understanding this, it yeah. can sort of illustrate some of the strategic work we've been trying to do with regards to special education placement. We would rather include a student for as, as much as we possibly can for as long as we possibly can before we begin to place them in substantially separate programs or out of district programs or residential programs. And that effort has been paying off over the last several years. It does mean that we have more students in the district in our classrooms, in our general education classrooms who require additional services in addition to what the classroom teacher is providing. Um, but what you can see is that uh, our, the out of district line, which is the red line, um, has gone down over the past several years. This is showing the past 10 years. And the in district special education line, the students we're keeping with us, has gone up. Um, and they've crossed several years ago, right in the middle of that graph. And that just means that our spending moves to being in district services that we provide as opposed to out of district, which can be more volatile in terms of. You know, we're, we don't set the tuition rates for that, so we don't have as much control over it. Um, and then we don't have as much control either over how those students get placed in services once they are out of district. Uh, we're part of the team and we still have a coordinator that works with those families, but we're not the primary educator of the student at that point either. Um, so we're really proud of this because it's great that we're keeping these students with us, that they're learning with their peers, that they're getting more opportunity to access the gen ed curriculum. And it's some of the reason for those changes that you've seen in the 
numbers. Yeah. Okay. I could add I, one, yeah. one thing. That table that you're looking at is also just the general fund spending. Mm -hmm. So we also spend for out of district, we spend for the circuit breaker account. Yes. So some years, a different CFO may have allocated those funds differently. Okay. So there probably is more spending on out of district residential okay. that's not being shown right now because we're not we're funding. We decided to fund it out of a different pot. So that's a little bit of misleading chart. So if it goes from the circuit breaker, goes straight to the out of district residential. Like it, it wouldn't show up on here if it comes. It would show up on a different table. Just okay. that that view is a little bit misleading. Okay. Some of the schedules are limited to just the town appropriation. I, I mean, I think moving kids back into district when it's appropriate for them, I think is fantastic. I was just thinking residential is for the very neediest of kids. And so the mm -hmm. idea that the very neediest of kids disappeared or moved into the district was, you know, it, it, it is fantastic when they can be moved into district when that's, when that's uh, needs for kids. Um, and then, sorry, may I ask another question? Yeah, um, sort of from a longer term planning perspective, um, I. I know that this is impossible to predict, but if you're thinking forward, now that we have this nice new high school, um, I think maybe there's some expectation that in the future years, if we see more kids in the high school, just because more kids will choose coming to the beautiful Arlington High School with all the fantastic facilities. Do you have any guess for whether we expect more kids to be at Arlington High School choosing that over, say, private schools or moving out of, you know, charter schools or moving out of Arlington? versus kids coming from Minuteman, just because that makes a difference, you know, if we're not spending on Minuteman, but we're spending more on our tonight. Like, do you have any sense for what we expect? I wouldn't put a stake in the ground with numbers. Um, I would say it's certainly our hope that the new facility once this, particularly once the next phase opens, will be very attractive to for students to either not go to private school or to come, come back into the high school from private school or to choose the high school. Um, over Minuteman as a potential option, unless the programming is what they're really what works for them, and we, it, in an effort to ensure that, are doing visits with our eighth graders. We did a visit with our eighth graders very early this year before they were having conversations with um, Minuteman, for example, so that they could see the facility and see the space and sort of understand the programming of the high school a little <laughs> sooner. So we're going to continue doing that um, and do a round of that after we open the second wing to show off some of the new programming we can do. Thank you. Grant, do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, so you mentioned the um, level one students uh, increase. How, these are number of questions, not policy or strategy. How many uh, level one students do we have this year or now? I would have to go and gather those numbers. Um, I can say that at, I know that in the first several months of the year, at least 10 families entered the district whose students did not speak any English. So we're level one English learners. Um, at Pierce, Addison, <coughs> and Thompson, in particular, we've had increases large enough to warrant additional staffing. So you, you sort of tip over once you have more than 15 students to an English learner teacher who might be going into the classroom with those students and doing pull out specified support, then you want to take a look at your numbers and the levels of those students to decide whether or not you want to add another teacher. At Thompson and Audison in particular, we had a lot of level one students add in this year that have led us to take a look at staffing levels at those schools. Thank you. So that sort of kind of goes into the second question is, what, how much would you say the increase is? So we went over some sort of limit, it sounds like. To, how, what about, you know, 10%, 20%? I, again, I'm not going to answer that sure, okay. without the numbers right in front of me, but we look for about a 15 to 1 ratio of English learner student, depending on the profile and the level of English proficiency <laughs> of those students. Right. Okay, thank you. Also, uh, one other question, if I may, but it might be... Uh, <coughs> very non-educational, very operational. Um, how are the utilities, I know the costs of you know, heating and electricity, how are they shared with the town, with the school buildings? Um, how, how are they shared? Yeah, are they separately built? Yes, yes. Separately? They, each building is metered separately. So the high school has actually several meters for that example. So um, the old building currently has, we're running off one meter and then the new building Going forward, we'll have one meter, but the current new building is a separate meter. 
So each building though usually has at least one meter that is running around front and we get built independently for each of those schools. I see, okay. So you need to know from school to school which ones, you know. Co correct. All right. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions, John? Sure. Um, thank you both for the presentation and for all the work that went into it. Um, without getting into like all the details, um, maybe just at a high level, uh, if I go back and look at the budget from uh, FY 2020, mm -hmm. there was 6,047 students in the schools. Uh, this, in, then in the current year, is 5,987. So, you know, pretty much, pretty close, uh, actually a little bit, about a 50, 60 student drop. However, there's, uh, if, you, if you go back to the FY 20 budget and you compare it to the FY 24 budget, there's 82 additional FTEs. Um, and then the, the budget's gone up in addition to the, for those, F, uh, in that time period, the, the budget's gone up 14 million. So I'm curious, is that, are there any macro trends driving those increases? Is it COVID? And if it, if it is COVID, should we, you know, consider like a post COVID budget? So any, any macro trends driving those, or is it just a lot of specific details? Um, you can start. Okay. So I would say, our per pupil expenditure in the Arlington Public Schools uh, is below, is right around median and below average for the town manager 12 for our peer communities. And there are expectations surrounding core programming that we've been working our way towards over the past several years in Arlington that were part of the promises of the previous override and that are built into the APS strategic plan. So just as an example, if, if I'm asked, you know, what's the core programming for staffing that you would expect any school to have, any well-run, well-staffed school to have. Um, I just mentioned librarians. We're working towards this. Um, I mentioned technology teachers. We don't have a, a technology teacher at every school. They're sort of split across multiple schools. We're working towards that. Um, in, I would expect that schools our size to have an assistant principal. We accomplished that in fiscal 22. So that was an addition in fiscal 22 to just have an assistant principal and a principal, two leaders leading each school. Um, to have a literacy and math coaches is typical in a schools that our peer communities have. These, they have these roles. We accomplished that in uh, FY23 and math coaches in FY21. Um, as I mentioned, we'd love to have family and community liaisons. We're just adding one on a grant this year. And then there's the service delivery professionals, making sure that we're meeting the needs of our students with IEPs, um, meaning, making sure that we're providing intervention services before we hit a point where a student might need an IEP and then need specialized service. So we need to use um, ratios like the one I just mentioned for EL, 15 students to one EL teacher, to guide when we add and when we don't on that. And we've been improving our capacity to do that over the past few years, which has led to increases in special education spending um, in, that are mostly tied to and linked to services. So I would say that a lot of what you're seeing there is tied to us prioritizing professionals, licensed professionals in the classroom over say paraprofessionals. So that will drive salaries because the salaries are higher um, and programming expectations, making sure that we have these core program staffing as well as the specialized program staffing that we would expect in order to be able to serve the needs of the students we have. COVID contributes to this because COVID created the need for additional staffing and health services um, over the course of the pandemic and expectations around what health services will look like and health response time will look like, uh, special um, and social, emotional and mental health needs. Uh, and we have now more students sort of presenting with potentially intervention needs or special education needs. And we're trying to make sure we can meet those as quickly as possible to avoid having students in less inclusive spaces. So uh, that'd be my prediction for what's driving some of those adjustments. That's right, Milan. Yeah, okay. Um, that makes sense. And then I, I, I mean, I, like I said, I could get into the weeds. I don't want to bore, bore everybody, but um, like for instance, like the Hardy School seems to have nine new FTEs. It, it was enrollment went down there. I don't know if something's going on at the Hardy School. Potential differences in how that's coded. So and the budget's <clears> up by 1.3 million. I, I could go up and down the whole thing. It seems like the HR department is up significantly. The, the business department is up significantly. So I'm just wondering: is it has there been a top-to-bottom analysis, you know, for the post-COVID world 
Uh, but I mean, the explanations you gave were great, but I'm just wondering, if, you know, are there some other costs that we should be looking at too? I guess, um, so what I will add to Dr. Holman's response is that, so some of the FTEs and, and through going through various budget processes is also cleaning up data. And so what you're also seeing um, is that there's a variance because when I when I started doing the budget process and coming into Arlington yeah. and what was previously put into the budget are shown in the budget book versus what you're seeing. So sometimes year to year, looking at the numbers is not actually the best way to even like try to delve and do an analysis. Yeah. Um, what, what, I, I, what I also will add is that, like, for example, for the Harvey School specifically, is that during the pandemic, there were lower paid staff added to the budget um, in anticipation of absences, to cover absences for teacher and staff, and also just requests in terms of how to cover um, space, the support students' spaces. Um, like um, they were looking for an example would be um, almost like a, a campus aid, but they were like building substitutes where they were support the students between moving between like going to the bathrooms and, and watching space like that. So we increased the budget and you'll see that in the budget in those years during the pandemic. Um, and, but they, yes, their enrollment did decline for that specific answer. Yeah. To your question about, do we do analysis to assess increases in budget or staffing to a particular school against enrollment, against like needs? The answer is yes, we do, uh, and this is a new habit of ours, um, to do roster reviews with each of the principals and building leaders as a component of the budget process that we undertake so that we are asking that very question. What is it that can be eliminated or added to based on the needs of the kids in, the, in that school at that time? Um, Hardy has also acquired a, a learning community um, from the bracket. So we've moved some staff over and we're also working to make sure that we code positions to the schools as often as we can in the budget. Um, and that isn't necessarily the way historically positions have always been coded. Sometimes they've been coded system-wide. Um, and as we get more positions into, if, for example, as we have more uh, elementary literacy coaches coded to a specific school because we finally got to have one at every school or we get a librarian coded to the school because we finally got to one at every school, that's gonna show up as a new school FTE, even if a FTE came off of the system-wide roster. Um, and so it will look like an increase there. So if you don't offset it against all of the other areas where an FTE yep. kind of moved around, that you won't catch that. Yep, uh, however though, like I said that, I mean, it sounds like you are doing the analysis, but that wouldn't necessarily explain the system-wide increase of 80 FTEs. In other words, I see the reclasses and how you keep your records and data may change year to year. I completely understand that. But at the end of the day, it does seem like you have 80 plus additional FTEs over that period. So And yeah. programming can explain a lot of those adjustments, the in improvements and increases to programming as yeah. expected. But additional services. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Um, yeah. First of all, I apologize for this. I think I'm duplicating what Annie asked, but I just didn't hear the conversation. Um, you're eliminating a communications and grant person in finance and then adding a grant administrator uh, at a reduced level and a director of communications at a much higher level. Is mm -hmm. that what's happening? Yes. Okay. Um, you feel like you're fully using AYCC? Yes, they provide excellent services to our schools. They, they, so we refer students where we hit a level of service that we can't provide with the social work that we have in the system. We have a, an agreement with them in the amount of 30,000? Yeah, 30, $38,000. $38,000 every year for them to provide additional counseling services at our schools. And then we use that uh, referral service with them. And they'll come to our schools and provide services alongside our social workers. Okay. Yeah. And my final question, I don't know, is uh, I know you're in the process of a plan. Uh, I can't remember if you called it a three-year or a five-year, you know, plan going forward. Uh, maybe this is more of a suggestion than a question. Um, and I made the same comment at the uh, Long Range Planning Committee meeting, uh, but in June of 26, 
which is only three years away, we're facing a possible override of something in the range of 20 to $25 million. Um, as part of your plan, are you putting together sort of an emergency budget reduction? It, it, it was thinking about that. Yeah, um, the plan is in response is built by the community and what the community has said that they are hoping that the schools will provide. And so we would certainly have to do if there were to be a failed override an emergency budget set of considerations and we would use some of the same processes that we've engaged in in trying to find efficiencies for the budget in order to do that. Um, it would be a much more challenging process to do that uh, if we were to have to engage in that now because we would have to take away services that we know are needed uh, in order to do it. But no, the, the five-year plan is a forward-looking plan developed by members of the community to reflect what the community feels the schools need to do. It doesn't include that sort of scenario. Yeah. If you have it in mind. We have it in mind. Good, thank you. Sophie? Um, so in the past year or so due to federal lawsuits, there's this proportionate share plan mm -hmm. um, where public schools, uh, private schools in a community can ask for public school support to go into the private schools. Have our private schools in Arlington asked Arlington to send in service providers and what, how does that show up in the budget? Mm -hmm. So that, that falls under our grant funding. Um, so we have a proportionate share in the IDEA special education grant and um, each year. Uh, in title. Yes, yeah. I mean, yes, in title, title one. Um, and each year they get, a, uh, the private schools do get a, a portion of the grant to use. Um, and we were allowed to carry it over for, I think, two years. And then we were supposed to post it to, to the schools in the, the community um, before we decide to turn it back on um, if they do not spend their funds. So that's the process that's been in place. Um, and those would be part of that 3% of grants. Those dollars are in there. It's not 3%, but it's much smaller. And, and mostly they use it for professional development and sometimes supplies and materials for, for the, the, the PD and or for students. So are you actually, are any of them are you actually sending staff to, to do support for students on site at the private schools then? So there, there are staff that are on site for those schools for those schools that are participating in those funds or receiving the elements those funds. We have students who receive services from us who might be a student at a private school. Uh, they receive those services on our site from our service providers. So that wouldn't be. So you haven't gotten, because I know in Cambridge, some Cambridge providers can go to the private school, but we haven't sent anybody into the private school. Yeah. 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 Two over. There's two different programs yeah. that we're talking about. But, but, but bottom line is that there's the program where there's staff that we pay that get that's proportionate to get yeah. professional development and that they are providing services at the private school. And then there's the services that we, that are our service providers, yes. they come to us. That's not proportionate share. Right. Thank you. Other questions? Charlie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Mason and Dr. Holman, uh, I want to say that this uh, presentation and budget continues the, the tradition of, uh, in, of increased clarity and transparency and visibility that we saw last year. And it's just a breath of fresh air. And I congratulate you for it. Um, <laughs> Of course, the increased visibility and transparency leads to additional questions. <laughs> so I have three, three questions, three areas I'd like to ask a question about. So the first is, um, you know, as, as John was mentioning, he had this, this high level view about the change in number of personnel and the rising costs. And, and, you know, you had some answers about the past three or four years, which were, uh, you know, made, made sense to what was happening there. But on your website in February, you posted the first version of your budget, and there was a table in there, position control table, that showed fiscal year 23 and fiscal year 24 salaries and FTEs. Uh, more or less, the, the FTEs was, were around 1,000, and the increase between 23 and 24 was 0.8%, I think six people, or whatever, which is, which 
I think reflects very well on your um, focus on efficiencies and trading, um, you know, one, one position for another that's not necessarily needed or whatever. However, the salary increase the, 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 for the same number of people went up by 13%. Now, this included all the positions in the school system, I believe. If not, you can, you can tell me that, but I think it does. So um, what troubles me is that um, you mentioned earlier about the, you know, the teacher's salary level. And, and I've been doing some research. Uh, there is state, state data on teacher salaries levels going back to about 2017, maybe. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Um, the, certainly the Arlington teacher sal average salary level is below the median in the state. But the rate of increase is in the top, it's about number 40 out of the state, 4%, 4.4% a year. Uh, higher than the rate of increase in most of the, I think it's higher than at least some of the town manager 12, but I haven't looked at all of them yet. Um, the last couple of years, the, the average salary in teacher salary in Arlington went up two to four percent. I forget which year it was. So let's go back to 23, 24. And, and I don't know what the, how many teachers are in that position control uh, table versus non-teaching positions. But let's just take the assumption that 60% are teachers and 40% are not teachers. If the 60% if the are getting an average increase of 2 to 4%, let's say 3%, then the remaining 40% are getting a 30% increase to come up with that 13% average. I mean, this is the mean value theorem. It's the way mathematics work. So my question is, if the, the first question of three is if the position count is essentially the same and and the and the rep, the salary increases go are going up by 12.9% and and a big chunk of the personnel are not getting 12% increases who's getting all the money <laughs> good question and why okay and I and I think that I think this reflects on John's comment that we, we need to have I think I think we need to have a little more um, discipline in a top down uh, look at the entire budget and and the and the elephant in the room is that in the five year plan at least the last one I saw the school department is looking for nine million dollars increase in the next three years and. I think where we are should be informing us as to where we're going to go. And we don't want to, I certainly don't want to go someplace where we're going to be given 30% increases to, to some component of the staff. And so that's the first question. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. So to answer your question first in, in regard to the positions, right? So overall, we're seeing, we are seeing increases of positions. In this budget, and so when you look at that position schedule, um, or at that time, it reflected also new positions being added. So that variance, unless you back up those new positions, you're you may not have the actual correct increase rate. So your number was including the increase of those positions. We did in the newer version, we have removed it out. So. Um, understood that it's not as transparent in that sense right now to make the point that you want to make, but those positions would need to be back out. So it's not 30%. On average, people are seeing about a four and a half percent increase. Um, what you um, had shared, uh, Mr. Foskett, earlier about Arlington in terms of seeing the average teacher salary increase, um, Part of that is a factor of many things. Uh, well, a couple things. Um, that is partially based on hiring practice. The, 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 the people that are part of that, of, of a, the comparative years are not the same group of people. And so when we are actually hiring staff, um, more their principals have been looking at more talented staff that are demanding more money coming in. And so when they're coming in, they're coming in at higher steps 
and they're not growing much after they come to those highs. So if they may come in at step nine or 10 versus coming in at step two or three. And um, we top off at step 12. And they're not, some, some staff are coming in and then they're finding it, oh, it's better to get paid in Cambridge because it's, it's, they pay a lot more over there. And it's not necessarily comparable to the, to the communities that we compare ourselves to because 10 minutes to 12, there's some are, are nearly like right next to us, abutting us. And then some of them are in different parts of the state, but the communities that are right next to us are paying substantially more. And so what, you know, when, when we're talking about like long-term planning is that we have to create a, create something that's competitive to show when we're trying to recruit people beyond just placing them on a table. So what you're seeing when you're talking about these figures is more about practices that are in place per se when hiring, not really showing that our teacher contract is moving these teachers at a faster rate. It's more that like teachers are coming in and going out or staff is coming in and going out and we're hiring at higher rates to be competitive. <clears throat> Okay, that's a sort of a subjective answer to a quantitative question. But um, I guess, you know, at some point I'd like to understand um, what drives that 13% increase when, when you have the bulk of the, the, bulk of the uh, teacher group not getting anywhere near the 13% increase. So, so what what's it gonna you would have I would I would love to have a conversation with you offline about in terms of the numbers that you're you're looking at, um, because I think you're including new positions that are added at higher rates. I'm including all the positions in the position control table. That include new which, positions. Which was zero a zero point eight percent growth one year to the next in FTEs, and almost twelve a twelve point nine percent growth in total total salaries. So okay. Let's, you know, let's not drive that horse into the ground. Um, the second question is, um, you, you have uh, $937,000 here in new ESSER positions this year. That money is going to go away. Um, are those positions going to go away, or are you trying to roll those positions into the override program? You're so, very careful about what we place. Yeah. Before you answer that. It's not that much money. That's why I want to clarify. Yeah. So it's misleading to say it's nine hundred and thirty something thousand dollars being added as positions because it's about five to six hundred thousand. So I want you to be aware of that. It's your total. No, that's other one time spending is at the bottom. So if you go to, if you look at the slide, it's other one time spending, meaning those are not going to get added to the base. They haven't the exact spending hasn't been identified or approved by the school committee yet. So, so if I may interrupt and just rephrase the question, then is the 600,000 or so going to be rolled into the base budget or is that just- So a few of the positions before Dr. Holman responds, a few of those positions are, may not move into the regular budget because they are one year positions. Okay, that was my question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and the others of them are trial positions that we want to try so out, it's assess, really temporary spending. decide whether it goes into the base. So in the third question is so, somewhat similar to what uh, Rebecca raised before about the space ending, spending. And I think, Mr. Mason, you know that this is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> yes. And um, I, again, the, if you look at to what Arlington reports to the state on special education spending, that number through what I consider good management on the part of Arlington is going down. And it's, if you look at the last five years weighted average, it's probably 5.5%. And traditionally the school the system has asked for 7% growth in, um, in that spending category every year. And we're realizing 5.5%. And I know this year, I think it's 6% uh, or 6.5% in your budget, the proposed growth. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we forecasting what the weighted average tells us we're actually spending? Um, that's a good question, Mr. Fox. Let um, me just pull up my computer real quick. And I can tell you that I'm looking at the, if you were to look at the compound annual growth for special ed spending. Um, I, I've looked at all the numbers. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you based on, if you look at, so the five-year compounding annual growth rate is showing, yes, 
a trend that you would say that would show a substantial decrease, right? Yeah. But um, when, if, you, if you actually look at it, it's more closer to 6% currently with the, the concluding our 2022 data that hasn't been released okay. yet. I, I don't know what I, I look, I got it from the state and I, and I just took their tables and it was a little bit more than five and a half percent compounded growth. So maybe it is 5.8% or something, but we're, we're forecasting 6.5%. And and I and I just think, you know, if the it's is a testimony to the improved performance of the system of the school system mm -hmm. that this number is going down, and I that should be reflected in our budgeting. That's that's my it's just a comment. So if I could just make one more comment, and I appreciate that uh, that point, we do have to be mindful that there's the fluctuation. Of special education out of district spending. And so, one point that we made in this year's budget, when I presented today, was that there's a 14% increase in OSD. And the enrollment, even though it's been showing downward trends, does not mean it's not going to um, fluctuate. And it's, it's, I mean, it's, it can go up, and we're not anticipating that. And we don't have a way to really buffer us from that. So, we do. I think it's very important to be mindful of that. So just a, a question. I, I thought uh, that we, at town meeting, approved a number of years ago a um, special reserve account to handle, I can't remember whether it was on the school side or the town side, but it, we have somewhere an account to handle the big fluctuations in um, special education, and we're supposed to be putting some money into that every year. The reserve account doesn't have enough money to handle the types of. Could you stand up and speak actually louder? Better. My back's a little bit The reserve account doesn't have enough money, can't have enough money to handle the sorts of variation that we can see. But the other thing is that did we ha do we have the table that shows the ages of yeah. the kids? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've been doing is keeping a lot of the kids in district. And no, that's not. This is a different way to look at it. Okay. Okay. So it's, it doesn't. Okay. This is um, based on di the different different groupings of middle school, elementary, and middle and in high school. So. Okay. okay. Which um yeah what's so what? so the yellow students here are high school students out of district, and this is from 2017 to 2022. So yellow is high school students who are out of district. Red is middle school students who are out of district placed and. Um, and blue is elementary level students who are out of district place. You see the overall decline. And as students are aging out, that yellow bar gets smaller and smaller. So as students continue to age out, that all of the bars will go down and that yellow bar will eventually age out over the next several years. But doing that means we're spending more in, in the district. schools, in district, and not all of that spending is coming on the special right. education that's what is okay. what's what are you reporting to the state? I mean, you're required to report these things to the state. You have to have, I have to believe okay. that you're giving the state the correct information. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't want to argue anymore, but the only other suggestion I would like to ask is um, there's no reason why if this money, if this is declining, that we should not be taking if, you, if you're going to go with six percent or six and a half percent, you should take the back the difference between the five and a half percent actuals and the six and a half and put it into the reserve fund to handle fluctuations. I mean, if there's no money in the reserve fund, it's because you haven't put money in. Uh, enough, enough said. I'm sorry to be um, well said. Uh, aggressive here, but I, I I do think it's a great budget. I think the presentation is great, but I if we real if we're looking at nine million dollars increase. In the school spending in the next five years, um, we need to have a, I think, a more disciplined approach to these various spending categories and, and push them down, not uh, have large increases. So, uh, Jennifer, uh, thank you. Um, so you might imagine I'm going to defend the schools. <laughs> um, so, um, so one of the stories seems like they were telling us is that we've seen an increase in professionalization. So some of the um, concerns that I think Charlie was raising 
um, is that you have sort of park professionals being taken off the books, but you have a library professional who's making a lot more money, right? So it's not it's not that a single individual is getting thirty percent increase. You have you know people who are much more interested. Um, you, I mean, and the other story that you're telling us is a story that with the support of the taxpayers that we really are getting to a point where we have a much more functioning school system than we did um, two years ago. And I just want to tell you a personal thing. When I came to Arlington, the level of school services, which was very, very low. So the, the, I think the feeling sometimes that the finance committee is that any increase is bad, right? But when I came to the school system, we did not have a dedicated nurse. We certainly did not have a librarian. We, um, uh, let's see, what, what, what PTOs were paying for copy paper, um, which, and library books, of course, um, that's not happening anymore. There's a lot of, uh, you know, burden on uh, families, uh, kindergarten fees. We had high, one of the highest sports fees in the area and, in, and certainly compared to our comparable communities, um, high instrument fees. My son came in not being able to read in second grade at a level D, never received services. Right, so we have, we are coming into, we now have a, a school system that is much, much better functioning, that is actually functioning at the level that I think our kids deserve. So I think we have to take that into account when we look at these numbers. I, I, I think that everyone in this room is proud of the work that has been accomplished by the schools in the recent year that I think we out about that. Like what we're talking about is, is just, uh, being fiscally wise. Um, Dean. So I'm going to loop back to Charlie's question because I, while he was asking it, I thought an illustration that I think might be helpful. Do you have your budget book with you? Yes. Um, I can bring it over to you. <laughs> no, it's, it's not okay. there. Yeah. We can't pull it up on the screen. No, no, I can articulate what we're both going to look at very simply. So if you go to page 125, yep. which are in the position control, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to find an account on the program description, 6824 inclusion support. That line item says that we have two FTEs this year making $0. Next year, we're going to have one FTE making $32,000. So if that phenomenon repeats itself multiple times, it creates a picture of a school system that is um, doing exactly what Charlie articulates. And I think if you could kind of espouse on what's in an FY23 budget actually whatever, and what's in FY24, it might be helpful to illustrate why these quirky yeah. things are showing up in the, in the document. I can share it on the screen. Yes, it? please. Yeah. Because okay. because right now my my battery's about to die and I'm trying to. Uh, what page? <laughs> Go to page one twenty five. Okay. Okay. You go to um, sixty eight twenty four. That's what we use as the example. Come sixty eight twenty. It says on your program description sixty eight twenty four yeah. inclusion support. Okay. Page one twenty five. Are you looking at the old budget book? Yeah. On this? Are, are you looking at the um the I, one that was voted? No, I'm looking at the one I printed out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me let me pull that one up. I, I have that one too. I don't, we can do it either way. I guess my, my point is if I could find another one. If you go through this position control document. Uh -huh. No, 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 no. Which is what I think. Which is what Charlie was looking at. What's the page again? I'm sorry. On this page, 125. 125, okay. Um, okay, so we're trying to make this a little bigger. It's 128, maybe? It says 125. Well, they're throwing every page. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's you can find the one every page. No, maybe not that one. In the early budget. Yeah. 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 This is one this is page one twenty-five of the previously circulated one. There's sixty-eight twenty. No. No, no one I'm looking at. Dean, if you pass it over to me, I can pull it, I can probably spot out exactly what you're looking at. It's there was a section that wasn't included in an earlier version. It happens, this happens a lot in the early budget. Yes. Looking at. Yeah. So if you look here, yeah. 6824, wait, 68, where am I? We're radius. Sorry, mm -hmm. 6824. 
zero dollars and two FTEs. It's on page one. Thirty-two thousand dollars and one FTE. So if you roll this phenomenon down to the bottom, got it. You end up with no change in FTEs because you got two here and one there in different places, and then yeah. you end up with what appears to be a massive extent in yeah. dollars. Gotcha. And this was corrected in the later, and we we removed some lines out of there. So this earlier draft that you're looking at. Um, I, I apologize if you're pulling that. It was incorrect at that time. If you go to the current document today, some of the some of the data is not there, and some of the FTEs have been corrected due to uh, pivot table back backdoor errors so that was going on. So that's been corrected. Perhaps you could share the revised table that looks like that with us because you can't pull that information out of your current budget report. So the the budget that was sent out um, with the agenda. Um, just like in the past, I can't remember what day it was attached to the agenda. That's the updated one. It'll have a March 16th date on it. And it's like um, something about voted yeah. is, is in the title of the file. But it doesn't have that data. Okay. So, so, the, problem. Problem. so the position control is it. So, no, so not with the FTEs. So, we, so are you looking for the, the number of FTEs? Well, you're looking for the FTEs are on there. What you're looking for is the dollar amounts. Which was well, removed. A little bit the same comparison. Yes. Dollar to dollar and FTEs to FTEs. Yes. And that, that's what it looked like. As we were going through uh, further correcting the budget, um, due to potential negotiations, we had to remove money, the dollars out. In the future, once everything settles, we will I will gladly provide that back. I we took it, we took it out of the out of presentation for other purposes internally. So we'll bring it back out in the future version and we'll send it to this committee. Uh, other questions? So for Yeah, so um, getting back to enrollment, um, does the, your models include um, the new construction that's going on in town? Uh, like MIRAC is over 100 units, mm -hmm. 1021 to 1025 now. Sab is moving through the process, which would probably be another 50. Sunnyside Place is, I think, 43. There's some smaller ones, and there's from the planning department with no numbers better than me. Do your models include like, any effects of that? So the models, these models that, these models would not include those particular changes. No, um, there's a lot of variables that, you know, that the models would not catch. What it does consider only um, that based on uh, the data from vital statistics is the birth rates of Arlington. Okay. Um, but that doesn't mean that somebody can be born in Arlington and years later, the family finds job work elsewhere and they go somewhere else, right? Um, it doesn't include real estate trends, sales, vacancy rates. So that's not included as an assumption. Um, it doesn't also include if new schools pop up, you know, alternative education options pop up, you know, um, and it doesn't uh, reflect any other economic factors that may come down the line um, and which may influence people to either stop paying for private schools and putting, bringing their students into the public school system. So, okay. just all right. Um, and then the follow up, on that, yeah, I have a couple of small questions. Mm -hmm. um, well, the elementaries overall were kind of decreasing uh, in the last few years, and some had like pretty big drops. Pierce was increasing, mm -hmm. and it's a small school. So, are you running into space problems there? Uh, we have the space at that school to house the three sections at each grade level, and that's what we anticipate it's going to level off at. Okay. Good. Um, <coughs> right. Then, um, just just to get on to another topic that was brought up, the interventionists. I mean, like the math interventionists. Part of the point of that, right, is to avoid the need. To have a student need substantially separate and hence more expensive instruction. Okay. Okay. Um, and then finally, I noticed that in page 104, the athletic, the, the not fees, but the athletic budget has jumped substantially. Is that due to a reduction in fees or some other yes. driver? Well, if, yeah. So if you're seeing it on that that report on the general fund side, it's an uptick because before we used to collect fees and they would be offset by a revolving fund where we would collect that fees just offset. changed correct okay that and then there are we did 
there were changes to some stipend levels a few years ago where they made a step based on if staff stayed on board for a continuous amount of time, they would get a, a bump in their stipend. So there are some changes in terms of pay that's um, also being considered. Yeah, but these were just, these were very, mm -hmm. these were big jumps. Yes. Like many time, you know, many time increases. Yeah. But the budget should be around eight fifty to $900,000 for the athletic department in total. Okay. Just one final question on that. I noticed that this was ice hockey. The boys' ice hockey was way more expensive than the girls' ice hockey. And I was wondering, you know, what, what drove that? In terms of, um, I think it's, um, that's mainly, there's a lump sum payment that we paid to the recreation department for the, the rental for of the, the ice. ice. But it's, it's, it's not just for the boys. It's just where it's being posted. So that's why you'll, you'll see that big up jump. For that yeah because one is like the boys was like a hundred thousand and the girls was like eighteen thousand yes it's, so there's a there's about a sixty thousand dollar charge in there that we pay yeah. just the recreation the, department and you're just accounting for it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. on, on the uh, issue of sports i noticed that we're starting a ski team yes. how no, many communities me. around here have ski teams mm -hmm. i do not know the statistics on nordic skiing in the immediate area there are the new ski team is uh, Nordic skiing, cross country skiing, um, that was uh, very much advocated for by members of the community. And there are a few, but I don't know exactly how many. Um, and then we also had the uh, Alpine. Alpine ski team that has existed for the last couple of years that several communities have. And Nordic is you saying Western, Western Ski Center, I assume? I'm tapped to ask Mr. Bull. Sure. Carolyn, did you have other questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so some of them are simple. Um, which schools do not have a librarian, elementary schools at the moment? All of them will not have a full-time librarian with the exception of Pearson Stratton. They, the rest of them share the other librarians that are and, part of the school. And is there a reason it's there at Pearson Stratton and not elsewhere? That is, mostly has to do with a, with funding the additional librarians through attrition and current staffing of paraprofessionals. So we want to be, we want to try not to disrupt too many people's jobs in the process of adding okay. new goals. Okay. Um, what are some of the additional services? I mean, we've heard some of them, but what are the big ticket items? Uh, in terms of academic services, intervention services, which, which, oh, let's do, let's start with academic. Okay. Um, one of the goals of the strategic plan and some of the things we've been working on really recently is making sure that we get early intervention services in particularly reading and math uh, to students as soon as they signal so like uh, that they need it. So we do more assessment now, um, particularly in early literacy. This has been an ongoing initiative over the past several years to do additional reading instruction that's aligned with the science of reading and have additional interventionists available for students who need it uh, because they signal on a screener, which is also a service, like we have to pay for the screener, the software and the uh, materials to do the screen. Um, and then we have the coaches who kind of help the teachers determine based on the screening who needs additional services. And then we make small groups and then the reading specialist will provide services. So that's one example. Math interventionists do sort of a similar role um, we have specialists in uh, social studies and science. Those are newer, they're not brand new positions, in the, but they're newer positions um, that provide additional curriculum support for teachers and resources in those subject areas so that they can integrate that as well. In the elementary school? At the elementary level. Okay. Um, and then you're talking about losing teachers. Are we losing the novice teachers, assuming novice is first and second year? the intermediate teachers, three years or more, or the advanced ones that are 10 or more? So, yeah, I don't have numbers in front of me in terms of exactly how many. We tend to, but in exit interviews, which is mm -hmm. sort of the data we collect, right. and we're working on some better tracking and more mm -hmm. granular tracking of this over the next couple of years. We have a lot of teachers who stay with us through gaining professional status um, but who don't live in the immediate area. They might live outside of the um, 95 corridor and who, when they reach a certain point in their career, maybe they have children, they own, want to own a larger home. And so they move out and then they will get a job 
further yes. out, closer to home. Um, that is a growing trend. I wanted something closer to home, we see in our exit interviews. Uh, we do have staff who within their first three years might choose to move out. Um, and I increasingly see staff moving also in to Cambridge, to Newton, to other districts that are paying a higher salary. And they will tell us the reason why they're moving is because they can get, earn a higher salary. And it's, and there's those ones are within the first three years, at least the first that, three years. That, the ones that move for higher salary, I, I would say it varies between zero and 15 years okay. of experience. Typically our more seasoned teachers, those have been with us for 15 plus years are staying with us. Anything else, Karen? Other questions, Annie. So I'd like to go back to the subject of special education. I'm sorry, Annie, we can't hear you. I'd like to go back to the subject of special education and the reduction in those costs again, because for me, it's a red flag in the opposite direction from the way it's a red flag for Charlie. And that is that I would like to know what you are doing in terms of KPIs and process to ensure that your staff are not motivated to reduce costs by fitting square pegs into round holes and that you are ensuring through some kind of independent verification, testing, assessment, whatever, that students' services are being matched to student needs. Simply because of, you know, anecdotal experience from people that I know whose kids have gone through the Arlington schools who felt that their children were being steered towards programs that were not what testing indicated they needed, simply because those were programs that we had. Now, I'm not making any accusations here. I'd just like to know, are you sure those reductions are honest reductions and not simply convincing parents to accept what we have to offer as opposed to what the child really needs in order to reduce costs? Am I making sense? Um. And I know sometimes parents yeah. are very emotional program. about this. You, so you, I you take it from a programmatic perspective. Yeah. Okay. I, I will take it from the dollar cents <laughs> perspective. Okay. Um, and not to put student success in dollars and cents. I get it. Um, if, be mindful of that the special education numbers that we've shown, the, the budget is specifically items that are identified as special education students with IEPs and subset of programming or um, pull out tier two um, level services. Um, but some of those services, those tier, those, those pull out or pushing services are interventions and they're not labeled special education. So they're not in the SPED budget. Correct. They're in the general so, education budget. Yes, and you can, there's a schedule that wasn't included in the initial budget that if some were mm -hmm. looking at the initial budget, we, we spotted that didn't get pulled in and now it's there. It's the schedule for special education and interventions. And so you'll see our commitments to still supporting students' needs. And I, if there's anything you wanna add, I mean, on mm -hmm. the programmatic side, that, that's where I'll. We did add an additional uh, supported learning community last year, um, specific to students with um, specific learning disabilities, particularly in reading. Um, so that we can expand some of the programming we have available. One of the things I know I heard loud and clear when I started in the role was that we needed more transparency around and com better communication with some of our students, with, uh, families of students who had IEPs. And that's something we've very much been working on um, without knowing you know, the precise concern and experience of any particular family. It's hard to know what the discussion has been with the team at the school and what the recommended programming was and for what reasons based on what testing. Um, but we do have circumstances where families request outside testing and the school department pays for the outside testing so that we can get additional expertise in. And there are times when that's exceptionally helpful to our teams because we didn't do, we don't have access to a particular type of profiler testing. And then there are times when that comes in and it, it it doesn't match with what our team is seeing when they work with that student every single day. So each circumstance is unique and we try to treat them as unique and give the best recommendation that the IEP team can and that's within their jurisdiction. And, you know, I try to back up those teams as much as I can because that's what their role is, is to collaborate with the family to find the best placement possible. And if that's not within the means of the school system and we feel it's important to place the student in our district placement, then that's what we'll do. 
I just wanted to kind of have that discussion because, you know, I, I know it's been a concern in the past and I, I understand the, that it's a very complicated and sensitive area. And so, you know, um, when we did the original analysis to set that limiter in the five year plan at 7%, 7% was not the number we came up with as the growth in special education year over year. It was higher than that. Mm -hmm. So that was a number that was set based on what we thought was realistic and not what the actual increase in cost was. So if that's working, I'm really excited about that because we didn't expect it to work. Um, uh, I will say that I'm very pleased to see us expanding the, the, the sort of level of support for education in our schools to add back librarians, add interventionists, to add curriculum specialists. Having had kids go through the school system, I can tell you that, and I don't, I don't want to brag or anything like that, but I, I spent a considerable amount of money supplementing the education of my youngest child because of things the schools didn't offer and because of her particular talents. So I'm really looking forward to the commitment to support the talents and skills of, of everyone in the school. I'm not upset with the schools about that. It was what it was. But I always felt bad because I could afford that. And there are families in town who can't. We have kids who are just as talented as mine. So hopefully we get to a point of equity with this forward going budget. Thank you. Any other questions? No more questions? All right, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for answering all our questions. We appreciate it. Thank you all. Good to see you. Thank you. refers to the parking benefits of the electric vehicles is that it's the 15th yeah oh, I, I know yeah. is that this minute that yes. that's right parking yeah so yes. i just and i my memory might be wrong i i thought that the minutes didn't maybe reflect exactly the funding sources it refers to parking benefits money and then the town paying for the electricity but don't we have also some money 
that comes from the you know, from liquids in the chargers. So I just felt like the minutes didn't just quite just capture that. What what number are you on? Oh, yeah, I had it printed out, but I don't have it. Article 33. Okay. Three, yeah. Um, Article okay. 33. It's the first thing on the second page. Okay, thanks. So, I think the important thing is the net positive on the charging uh, stations to make money. So what is it exactly that? I wasn't sure. So yeah. I wasn't sure what the right thing is. It just seemed like it didn't reflect that we we're getting the the meters were paid. Part, we pay partially the electricity. Some of the money is being covered for by the current benefits. So that there's are and then there's additional pot of money, right? That that's what yeah. I remember, but I might be wrong. So Which of my money comes from the the, the companies that are yeah. um, providing these chargers. Is that right? Or I, yeah. I might be wrong, but it's memory. So. Brian, do you yeah. know the answer to that? Hang on, just I'm just catching up on on the minute. Yeah. Where on the minutes are we looking? 33A and 33A is at the top of the second page of the top minute. is. Thank you. Basically, the, the user of the charging station yes. pays everything. Yes. Right, and that's not in here. So yeah, that's just not in. It just didn't right. seem like the way it was phrased right. Right. Yeah. captured what the reality was. But yeah, I, the way it's worded makes it sound. You plug it in, and they charge you not only for the electricity, but they charge you for your share of the partner. Right. So, so not at all of me, because some places they're located where there is no parking right. meters. Right. This one says electricity is charged is paid for by the town. Right. With a portion reimbursed by the parking fund. It and it, it just felt like that yeah, didn't quite sure reflect that. what right. we had talked about. So it right. should be paid is paid for by the users. users. Yeah. Right. 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 users for town. Right. Yeah, okay. I, th portion. I think the I think that's the mechanics behind it, possibly. How it's like assessed. Okay. Okay. Oh. You can yeah, you can say it's assessed to the town, but it's paid for by the user. Okay, so um, the electricity for electric vehicle charging stations is paid for by the users. 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 Okay, um, and then should I just get rid of the rest of that? Or so the portion reimbursed to the parking fund. Um, I assume the company. Or I know, yeah, so like the parking charges with a portion are taken yeah. for parking. Yeah, with the portion that reflects the parking charges reimbursed to the town from the company collects. Yeah. Yeah. I think you should just cross off the meter located in the Jefferson Cutter yeah. House yeah. Yeah. because there's two more there's and then you got a railroad yeah. lot yeah. too. So I have one more thing. Like oh. Brian, you comfortable with that wording? Yes. Okay. Oh, so I, I don't think I have the wording yet. So can we just um, can we just repeat that, please? So um, electricity for electric vehicle charging stations is paid for by the user, and I'm sorry. Then a portion uh, paid to the parking fund. It's not a portion of the charge. It should, the should be it's reimbursed the from the parking fund. You can say to the parking fund if you want to say it that, that way. So you can say electricity and parking fees are paid by the user. Yeah. Right? Okay. The user pays it, goes them to the town. I'm not sure exactly how the town, right. but a portion is for the parking fund and a portion goes to charge point, I assume. For the, it's paid because charge point is a profit making company, I'm assuming there. Yeah. You can just say a portion yeah. is reimbursed for the parking fund. Yeah. Okay. You sit with that, Tara? Yep. All right, Jennifer, you had something else? Uh, one more thing, and, and, and this is again where my memory might not be quite right. I had thought that the town manager said that there's a very tiny bit of money that we would be paying the people whose land we were taking to create sidewalks, but it was not very much. But I could be wrong. Does that yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so this says no money. Yeah, so, okay. Okay. So, okay. But he's so, looking for an appropriation. So yeah. this is. Uh, this is for, it says no anticipated cost. No, so no anticipated cost, cost appropriation. appropriation. No anticipated appropriation yeah. instead of costs. Okay, okay. okay. because there are okay. costs, but it's rolled into the project. Whatever. Got okay. it, got it, okay. Any other question? Mm -hmm. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of 15? So moved. Is it second. seconded? Second. All right, any further discussion? 
All in favor of approving the minutes of the 15th as revised, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that passes. Let's look at the minutes of the 20th. Okay. Um, and paragraph 1A. Sorry, I can't see it yet. The, the Wi Fi in here is pretty, um, pretty slow, so it's going to take. I was going to take, right yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, 1A uh, row is still R O W E. Oh, someone just fixed fix that? You must have fixed that. It's the computer. Okay. It. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other corrections to the minutes of the 20th? So the, the alphabetical the order yeah, right. under yeah. Lauren Article 49 is off. Mm -hmm. Like there's two, two A's. Anything else? I have three little errors, but I'll let her. Okay. All right, yes. Uh, I think it, uh, and, and well, let's see, 750 from previous year, Jason Russell, I think it's two L's. Sorry, which uh, number are you on? Page one, well, it used to be D, now it's, E. I think it should be Russell be in there. Russell, two else. Three lines up yeah. the bottom. Yep. And then F should be invasive. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Instead, of, <laughs> instead of the invasive. Invasive. What's the difference? And then on the last page, cemeteries, first line. Uh, should be the E's. Oh, yeah, yeah. The e's. I always do that wrong. Sorry, what's this now? Um, cemeteries and F should be uh, all E's, all E's instead of an A. Oh. Did you just fix that out? Yeah, yeah, you should probably protect that. Mr. Jones, you should know better. <laughs> also, a little three. Just make it a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We do that all the time. Anything else on the minutes of the and 20th? Five. Yeah. Also. Street Sorry, is it spelled where's cemeteries in number five? It says vote. Well, see, vote the cemeteries budget. And then five, it says transfer of funds slash cemetery. It'd, it'd probably be a good idea to just do a search in the police. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. What else should we place? Oh, and uh, in seven as well. And then seven in two places. Any other corrections? Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the 20th? So, so moved. Second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Those are approved. What abstention? Who's the abstention? Down for abstaining. All right, so everyone in favor, raise your hand. Fifteen in favor, zero against, and two abstentions. And and those are Sophie and Al. Last. All right, the school budget. Jane, do you have a motion? Well, that would require me to know the exact amount, and I don't know the exact amount. I would, I that is a really good idea. So I move the school budget as presented. Can we um it, just I say that? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Please hold. Nine six zero nine two nine four seven eighty eight two three four. Oh, I got three. There it is. Thankfully, Peggy. Eighty eight. All right. Oh. Sadina's moved. 
uh, for approval of the school budget, name of eight eight nine four seven three three four. Is there a second? Second. 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 All right. Discussion. John. Yeah, I think I'm going to vote against it. I still can't get past the 84, 83, whatever the number is, additional FTEs. I think, um, you know, maybe we can afford it this year with an override, but then, you know, you do read in the papers that the, um, you know, the teachers unions are very aggressive. Um, you know, can we afford this next year if this is the new baseline? Um, and I know, like, you know, generally, you know, the, the nurses and the, uh, the librarians, excellent, love it. But, you know, I did look at the detail and I see, um, you know, additional people, the HR department has, has went up by about uh, 40%. The finance department within the schools has gone up by another 50%. I think that there's just a lot of additional FTEs in the school system that we may not be able to afford next year. We may not, we may not be able to afford the year after that. Um, so, and you know, some of the some of the elementary schools have gone down in enrollment, but you know, like I said, the Hardy's gone up. It has nine additional FTEs, um, and and then I compare it to the town personnel trends. You know, so those eighty three additional FTEs in the last three years, three or four years, depending on how you measure it, is almost double the additional FTEs in the entire town since two thousand four. The entire town has added, I think, like maybe 40 FTEs in the last 20 years, and now they're gonna add 80 FTEs just in three and a half years. So like maybe we can afford it this year, maybe with an override, but I just worry about the next years. If this is the new baseline, baseline um, you know, of course the, that'll hit the, the pension and that'll hit the healthcare costs. So I, um, I, I have concerns about that. Okay, uh, Charlie? Yeah, I, I'm also gonna vote against it. Um, partially for the reason that John just mentioned. Uh, I, I do know in 2000, I believe it was 2019 and 2020, the, um, the school had a forecast of uh, like, let's say 20 or 30 increased FTEs and they actually hired twice that many above their budget. Okay? I still don't know what they're doing. And, um, and then secondly, uh, I'm concerned that this uh, disparity in the in the uh, salaries that I mentioned in, in that table, which they very cleverly removed from the budget, um, it, it's gonna drive the, 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 the increase that the teachers need that they weren't given, okay? In other words, the, this money has been, been spent on other than the teachers. So they're sitting there looking at 3% increases and somebody else is getting 30% or 20%, that's just, that doesn't make sense to me. So I'm I'm not in favor of this, and and I think it has it has a um, sort of an, an until we see something better, it's a very to me a very negative um, sign. It's not a sign for the override. Grant, um, thank you. I'm conflicted on this. I don't have. When I vote against, I'd rather have an alternative motion. I don't have one for this. I, same as I, same as in, in previous budgets that I disliked and, and voted for. So, wish I could think of some alternative, but uh, I am conflicted about it. Thank you, Re Rebecca. And then you. Um, I have a question, just as a person who's new to this, about the mechanics of having eighty additional people that seem to be sort of a surprise. How is that possible? If they you know, are they not reflective of previous budget or if someone could just look like I don't, I don't think it was a, even, so maybe I'm not being clear. So I went back and looked at the FY22 budget yeah. and I compared the FT, FTEs in that budget yeah. to this FY24 budget. I just did basic subtraction. So yeah. I wasn't surprised. I mean, it was there for me to see. I did actually submit questions to them with department by department increases. So yeah, yeah I, I hope I didn't give the impression that there was any surprise. It was all there. You know, for the, for the viewership. Because I wonder if there if there could be more. I think they were maybe not as prepared as would have been helpful on the specifics. So, for example, with the Hardy School, if they had been able to say, my understanding is they have two or three new special education classrooms, and those have very high levels of funding. So, right. I don't exactly. know this to be the case, but if they had said, we have three new classrooms in the Hardy, they, something they, like that, they and did they, have they, they, they did questions later, ahead. They did say right they yeah, I only I pared my questions down actually. I didn't want to really bore everybody, but they they had all my questions ahead of me. So. Okay. Um, 
So I, I, I guess I would have liked to have been heard if there's an explanation for the nine at Hardy. Is there an explanation, you know, is there a new, there was a reference to the new instrumental music teachers, you know, yeah. one at a time that would have been very helpful because it's possible those things don't make sense. It's possible that Got it. Yeah. yeah. Yep, that's true. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Annie? So I would just like to start by reminding everybody that what we do to give the schools the general fund dollar amount is that we look at the uh, allowable increase, which I believe for the schools is three and a half percent, plus a differential for changes in enrollment, which can go either way. We may reduce it because enrollment's gone down, or we may increase it because enrollment's gone up, and it's a 50 percent of student cost differential that we put into the new students because we recognize that one new student doesn't require 100% of that budget, which includes the administrative support and a new teacher and so on and so forth. Okay. So they're living within that number. They're getting the same increase that we give them year over year. How they're managing to hire 82 positions that didn't exist before, I don't know, okay? But if they're actually doing that, they're paying somebody less because they're living within the three and a half percent. Let me finish. So the question here isn't if we really want to question the details of their budget, which I'm not sure we legitimately can because we give them a dollar amount and they have control of how they distribute that dollar amount across their budget. It's, it's polite for them to come and walk us through the details. But we are not allowed to tell them you can't spend this money on X or you must spend it on Y. It's just not our relationship to this budget. What I would suggest, though, if you are concerned about what they are talking about in terms of how they spend the budget, is that the question is not can we afford it, not why do they need 80 more people, so on and so forth. The question is do we believe that they are delivering a quality education at the level required by the students in Arlington? And that is really what the goal of the superintendent and the school committee should be, to deliver to the students of Arlington the education that they need to the fullest extent possible. And we can afford that. You say we can afford we it? We can afford it. And in fact, we should afford it. I would argue, and again, this is not a financial argument, so taking off my finance hat and putting on a different hat, I would argue that we're morally obligated to do it. So I've had this argument as, for example, as the treasurer of my temple, I've had this argument for the board that we're saying we can't afford health care for our, our, to insure our employees. Well, my answer was we're a religious institution. We're insuring our employees. We'll cut other things. We'll do other stuff. We'll raise dues. We'll do whatever we have to do. But, but we can't look ourselves in the face if we don't insure our employees. So that is continuing my argument about the school budget. What I see Dr. Holman doing that I think is different than what we've seen in years past is that she's actually laid out a five-year strategy. She said what the budget priorities are, and she's shifting where resources are sent in her budget to match the actual values and the actual priorities. She's moving <coughs> the budget the correct way. And I think she should be encouraged to do that. In terms of the practicality of Charlie's argument, Charlie's looking at top line numbers. But if you're going to remove two paraprofessionals from libraries and replace them with two librarians, then the cost of salaries is going to go up more than two and a half percent or four percent or whatever, because you're going to pay those two positions a much higher salary. And that is the counter argument that everyone's trying to make. You have to look at the details position by position to see whether or not and who is getting these higher raises. And then finally, I would suggest that when you have a thousand employees and an $88 million budget, you should have multiple people in your finance department and in your HR department. I work for a company that has maybe a hundred employees and we have three people in HR. And our budget is nowhere near $88 million. So uh, the idea that somehow we can do without administration is us looking for a lawsuit. I don't think anyone's saying going to be without an administration. Right? We're questioning, I think John is You're questioning, questioning the additions the to the administration. Additions. And I'm saying you have to look at it on a scale with similarly sized organizations. Yep. And a similarly sized organization would have a similar staff. Just because it's a school doesn't mean they don't need the same people in those same administrative positions. 
I'm very sensitive to the idea of spending money on administration that we don't need because I want that money going to kids. But I'm not seeing that in this budget. I'm not seeing that. Here, so people hand have haven't speech. yet spoken. Carolyn and then Dean, did you have a hand up? Yeah. And then Al Tosti. So one of your questions, and for those of you who are new, um, about is it a surprise? Um, the current finance person who was here, tell me his name again, Michael, Mr. Mason, only started what, three or four years ago? Yeah. yeah. And the budget prior to that was a complete disaster. Yeah. And year over year, it would show up differently when they presented to us. And they were trying to get better at it, but it was just sort of a shift to something that seemed even less transparent. This is a huge difference. Um, so, so that's one point. Um, I am concerned. There's two things I'm concerned about. One is, is the 7% for special ed a state mandated number? No. 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 So we're seeing them consistently spend between five and six percent at most. And so maybe, okay, maybe 6.5 some years. So is there a chance of lowering that number to 6.5? So um, there's a substitute. Yeah, Orange plan is actually yeah, six and a half percent. Seven percent. This is the last year, seven percent going forward to six and a half. So. Okay, okay, so I think so that was are, just so in the long range plan iterations. We are dropping it. Okay. Something we're, we're forgetting, which is wait, 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 okay. wait. Sorry. Carolyn has the floor. Continue, Carolyn. Okay, um, and, and so then I'm, Dean and then Al Tosti. So I'm glad to hear we're going down to six and a half percent. I also like Charlie's statement that if we're not, if this the sped money, I'm going to call it sped if that's the right phrase, but we're not. The spend money they don't spend should go into that reserve fund so that they have it for that volatility. Um, my question is, where does it go now? Does Are they allowed to use that money towards general or no? Um, Carol, can I add a step for you? Sure. Well, they said last year or the year before that they're spending it on edu other education costs. So it, the money's gone. Right, so that so so I have a problem with that. If it's sped money, it's sped money, and that's all it's for. It either goes back to the general fund or it goes into that um, other fund. Um, because, and I'm very concerned about us increasing the professional level of everyone other than teachers because the teachers are going to ask for more money, and they're going to need more money. And the, what paraprofessionals we have left. Are going to need more money as well. And she is talking about having other paraprofessionals. Um, and they deserve more money. And we're going to be negotiating with them in two years. And so we're going to see the budget go above the limited the 5% and the 6.5%. Uh, so that's my concern. Dean? So I mean, so I'm going to school funding officer who funds export, right? Um, I, I will say though, I think John and Charlie bring up very valid points that we have to take on look at the future, right? So, and I can be a, a, a repeat of what I say every year, but I'm say it anyway, um, which is, you know, I don't, we're, we're not going to manage the school department. And, you know, that we have to validate that the budget formula made sense. We're picking three and a half, seven, it all makes sense, right? So what I do is every year I go to the state testing website because I don't manage the school, but I can look at their numbers and I pull down total spending that they're for the state and I pull down their per pupil spending and their enrollment and I benchmark against the town manager 12 because at least lets you know directionally how things are working, right? So when I started doing it for the 2008-2009 school year, we have 4,800 kids in the school. We peaked at the 2019-2020 school year with 6,200 kids in the school. A massive increase, right? The ability to overall state um, state enrollment at that time, just to get people some perspective on it. 2008, 2009, we had 990 public school children. 2019, 2020, we had 982,000. So we actually went down 7,000 total public school kids. So the phenomenon in Arlington, well, similar to surrounding inside 95 communities, Belmont, Winchester, Brooklyn, Center, was not um, the statewide phenomenon. 
Um, what that did actually is the baseline against the town manager 12 is it brought us from 42, it's only Brookline, um, as a larger school population. At the same time, so then I go and I say, okay, well, that's, that's interesting, right? So now let's look at it against Perfume Center. <coughs> and I don't carve out some people like even district versus out of district. I don't because I don't make, that's a management decision, in my opinion, about sending kids in and out of district. I'm not the manager of that school park, right? So in 2008, 2009, we had $11,700 per pupil. They're ranked the sixth in the town manager 12. As our school population starts to rise, that per pupil benchmark erodes. We go down to eight, we go down to nine. It becomes really scary um, because as previous speakers have said, we start to eliminate things. We start to remove services and things like that, right? We then start to put some real commitment against it. We start to put it's that net in student spending. was first 25%, then it's 35%, then it's 50%. We had an operating override campaign in 2019 when we said we were going to put additional money against it. Lo and behold, our, uh, our benchmark starts to rise against the other communities. After bottoming out in nine in 2013, we leveled off at eight, we get some movement, and now we're at six, right? And the time is 12 plus less than 13, so we're, we're, we're in the middle, right? Um, which I'm not advocating to keep spending until we're number one, but I didn't say we should be number one, right? But it, it gives you a guiding light that, to me, in between all the noise, that the spending has been appropriate. Right now, what's also interesting after you do this is if you start to, um, it's interesting if you start to say, because this is the thing that always got me, right? A lot of people will say to me, they'll be like, well, the town's only going up this small amount, right? And it's like, right, well, you know, the total amount of roads in Arlington hasn't changed. So you're not going to plumb. You can't increase the, the deep W of the snow plumbing budget more because the roads aren't going up more, right? Um, and the population is generally the same. So you don't have to have this massive influx of new police officers and firefighters and things like that. When you're asking about lots of children, you need to spend on children, right? So when you then benchmark, I'm just gonna read some of this to you. When you start to benchmark um, per pupil spending, like you just, for so a total budget, take the per pupil number and look at it increase year over year. And the increases become, I'll start in 2013, 14. 4.3, 2.3, 4.5, 1.7, these are percent. 2.6, zero. And then it goes right up because of COVID, right? It goes seven and 14, right? COVID is vertical. Um, and so what that gets me to is the conclusion that we're not spending poorly on the school budget. We can argue a little bit right down stuff if it works, right? So that's why I support this year's budget. Why I said that I why I said that John and Chai bring up great points is there was a chart that showed um, school enrollment leveling off. So when you're putting in heavy investment, for, for net new students and things like that, and let enrollment start to level, you know, that, that driver's gone, right? So you really have to take a look at it and say, okay, what's the appropriate level of dollars going forward, right? And, and how does this balance between our role as a finance committee versus their role as management, right? And the like, so the example I'd give you is <clears throat> when they talk about increasing teacher salaries, um, I always, I look at it and I, I always struggle with that because like, we're, when I, when I point out who per people's running, like we're sixth, the town manager 12, Belmont's 13, and they use Belmont as an example of where teacher salary should be. And I'm like, okay, well, just take the school model of Belmont and put it in here. They have highly regarded schools are on the top of all those rankings. We're done. Like, why am I, I'm not managing the school department, right? Um, <laughs> Lower special needs. Well, I, well, that's, I, that's not my argument. I, I mean, this is this is the point though. We could go back and forth and back and forth. And so that's kind of the so I look at it and I'm like, great. So that does ask questions about moving forward, right? I think a lot of those are policy questions. Like when I bring up that example of like the thing, like that's a policy question. I can tell you categorically the Arlington schools against the dominant control are not underfunded anymore. The numbers are clear, right? But so when you want to do net, the next level of stuff, that's policy. That's not me. I'm not policy, I'm spreadsheets and numbers, right? Um, and so that's why I feel like it's Sort of both, right? I think the budget should be approved. I think they have been good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. But I think there are some questions as we move to that next generation or that next iteration of enrollment, what, what spending looks like. So, thank you. I'll talk to you. Please don't be <laughs> <breathing. laughs> First of all, keep in mind, we only control the bottom line of this budget. 
you could vote against it because of these 10 people and somebody else could vote against it and make those recommendations to the school committee and they could totally ignore us. Yeah. You want to make individual changes in individual budgets, then they should run for the school committee. I'm going to support this school budget because it complies with a plan that we have had in place since 2006. Now, some people in this very room declare it's not a plan, it's a projection, but I think it's a plan. Uh, it, it basically sets uh, what people could, what the increases are that people can have. Um, it, it, it started, uh, I think, with 4% on each side, and then a modification on the health insurance. And that got us through, you know, we got an override through with that plan, got through six years before we get more problems. Um, we, we, we got an older override and modified it a little bit. Um, we made a modification for special ed because special ed was going up faster than the others. So that modification was made. Um, and then uh, as, the, uh, as the budget was going up, and enrollment was going up, I'm talking skyrocketing. You, you don't see this in any other part of the Commonwealth except within 128. Uh, and, and it started, so we modified the plan to say it would go up uh, average per student probable times the number of increased students times 25%. And, you know, the school committee members on the long range planning committee uh, bumped it, you know, they, they thought that was too low, got bumped to 35% retroactive. And they should have got it up to 50%. Some members didn't think that was even high enough, but, you know, that was what everybody settled on so we could move ahead as a, as a community. And I have seen motions made at town meeting that said, you know, we make a motion to increase the school budget by 300,000. We think they need more money. And I've seen the superintendent of schools, not this one, a prior one, get up and say, thank you very much, but we really support the recommendation of the finance committee for that amount. Turned it down. Never find another superintendent whoever does that. And none of the school committee members got up to argue for the uh, extra money. This year, we have the plan all set, long range planning committee. You can watch it, it's a public meeting. And everything was set. And then lo and behold, the state came in with three and a half million dollars more money for the town of Arlington. All in chap virtually all of it in chapter 70. And there wasn't a peep about changing the plan from the school department, the superintendent, or any of the school committee members. They went with the plan that they had agreed to, and I think we should too. We, we shouldn't change something at the last minute. If there's going to be a modification to the plan, we should make that up front. Um, and ask the revisions be made in the next budget cycle. So it's right up front the problems we have. Now, I'll vote for this plan because of all that that I said. I'll not support an override that increases any additional spending for either school or town. Uh, every time we have an override, there's a jump in to get more money. So I'd urge you to support the uh, recommendation of the uh, uh, the head of the our subcommittee uh, and the school committee recommendation, the recommendation of the long range planning committee, you know, to move ahead uh, as a town united. And if we have problems with the override, which hasn't been decided yet, it's a selectman decision, uh, or, you know, going into next year. And I've got some big problems because of the 2026 override. We need to start planning for that. But at the beginning, not, not, not at the last minute. Um, so that's my recommendation and hope you go with it. Thank you. Anybody have any other uh, comments? Brian? Can I ask a quick question? Go ahead. Oh, oh, no, go, go ahead. Oh, I, I just, just kind of clarification. So I, I hear a lot about the plan. It sounds like we're just kind of following the formula almost, which is great. Yeah. I just, are we falling into the trap of um, all the COVID money coming in? And then, you know, so basically the baseline went up because of no. COVID. Okay, just no. throwing that out there. Yeah. I'm trying to repeat that again. So in other words, like, 
you know, we've always gone up like I heard like two percent, four percent, seven percent, depending on what you're actually uh, looking at. Um, but then for the last two or three years, we got a lot of COVID money. Um, so now are we just saying like, hey, we're just you know, we're you know that COVID money is going away. So, so, it be so one, one of the things one of the okay. things we did if you right. look, if you look at the historic if you look at the um, the town manager budget for the schools, you'll see that it has different buckets, and yeah. one is net new student growth. Okay, and so I had gone off on the high point of 2019-20, which is like 6,200 kids. Yeah. The following year, that number dropped. It created an odd scenario where we had funded for an increase in students and received a decrease in students. Okay, at that point, we were the, the, what goes up. The way the mechanics of it work, when yeah. you have money for net new students, you take away for lost. And so the following year, which I believe was the Let's go with 21 22 school year. If you look in your budget book, you're going to see a negative for that net new students, like a million three or something. Right? Right now. And so we removed the net new student growth from the budget because yeah, it's yeah. I'm okay. sorry, what else? One million three hundred seventy nine thousand seven hundred. Yeah. I just made it up. Look at that. <laughs> wow. I, when you, when you, were, when you, that, you know. took it out, and then as it goes back, it goes back. So, no, Justin, but you are right. There is some like one time COVID right there. Are you reading your percentage? Of the great. You said like it went up two percent, three percent, four percent, one percent, and then you you kind of went quickly, but twenty one, twenty two, or way up. No, I said seven fourteen. I said it went vertical mm -hmm. because so, that's what I'm talking about. What happened? Seven, was, okay. Right, because so what happened was because of, okay. it was it was anomaly. The budget was going up, like you said. Yeah. We added to the budget, and the students went down. Right, yeah. and we were hoping, we were expecting. Oh, so that's why the per pupil went up. Not yes. we budgeted for right. six sixty two hundred kids and fifty eight hundred children. Yeah. Right. And then the COVID money got overlaid on that. And then we adjusted it the year after. So the numbers I have, which yeah, was, it was a crafty political argument, you caught it, right? Yeah. Good job. Um, I have it with one year in arrears because we don't have the year that just closed out, 2022. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't show the adjustment. Yeah, makes sense. Right. All right. We're, we're running out of time, yeah. Brian. Um, I think every, well, people have been on the committee for a while know that uh, the school budget drives me crazy. Also, it's two thirds of the entire town budget. So we have to pay very, very careful attention to it. The only thing we're allowed to do is say yay or nay. We don't get a chance. We do not have the opportunity to say you should add teachers. You don't add teachers. We looked at, we're looking basically to bond on because even if we approved a budget and said you have to spend it here, they're not required to. It's the one budget in, that the state has set it's totally separate. That's the first thing. Um, now is not the time to demonize this budget. I'm petrified of this budget five years out. When you look at the five-year plan, it's up 25% and the growth in the students that they're projecting is basically flat. I'm basically for approving this one, assuming Dean goes into the school committee and tells them that they have to basically sharpen their pencils for the future. Because that's really what's on the line here. I mean, it, it's you just can't have this growth um, uh, uh, unchecked. Um, Al's right. We don't. We don't have the. This is not the time or the place to turn this down. I mean, they've done everything that they're supposed to do. Grant, um, I would um, have a well, quick question. I hate to take it from Charlie, but. Um, so we can say yay or nay, but we can also make an alternative motion for an amount of the yeah. board, right? We can? Well, I suppose we could. Okay, all right, that's a question. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay. Charlie? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I, I just want to say that I uh, have a strong disagreement with Andy on the subject of what we are obliged to do or can do. Um, we absolutely cannot tell the school committee what to spend individual amounts of money on instruction or otherwise. I think you know, what Brian said is absolutely correct. And, and that's, first of all, not permitted by law, and it's not something that we should be doing. On the other hand, if we we're supposed to be recommending a budget to a uh, town meeting, and from my perspective, if if I see that the management or the budget, budgeting and expense uh, processes and policies within the, the school department, uh, aren't leading in the right direction because of the, you know, the number of employees, the raises they're giving or other policies. I'm just not going to support the budget. 
I mean, that's my, uh, not only my prerogative, but it's in my view as a, as a town meeting member and as a finance committee member, you know, I, it's, it's an obligation that I have. So that, that's my, my position. Jennifer? Uh, just two small points. One is that when we did our last override in 2019, one of the things that came along with it, we had the three and a half percent increase, the seven percent for special ed, but there was also a five-year plan that was, had been presented by the school committee to increase spending. Now, the Long Range Plan in committee decided to find four years of that five-year plan. So there was a bump. So some of the increase in positions and money that you're seeing is because of that commitment. It was a very well publicized commitment. It was supported widely by the town. It wasn't hidden. Anyway, so that was one of the things that happened. Just one other small little point is one of the stories that's happening with our district right now is that we are seeing a moment shift from the elementary school where you might need to build new classrooms, which we don't have to do anymore <laughs> because we have a lot of capacity there now, um, to the middle and high school where spending um, looks a little different. And so you are going to likely see as those large cohorts move into the middle and high school, some changing of funding priorities. And 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 frankly, high school students are a little bit more expensive. But the, it also just might mean that things get changed around a lot. And you might just see that happening. So it's not, you can't say here's 6,000 kids and here's 6,000 kids. If the profile is different, you're going to see different spending priorities. So those, those just a okay. Anybody have anything else? All right, let's take a vote. Um, so there's a motion that's been seconded. So all in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Fourteen in favor, all opposed. Three opposed. Any abstentions? All right. The uh, motion passes. What, what was the vote? What, 14 to 3. 14 to 3. Uh, is that what you have here? Yes. Yep. All right. um, we have six minutes left. Could we do the composting in six minutes? Um, I, I actually think I can tell you the thing about the engineering that might be quicker. Okay. If we want to do that. Yeah. Composting feels like it's going to take a long time. Or maybe we yeah. should do it now. Yeah, Get it over quick. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we should do composting. Okay. All right. Let's do engineering. Yes, okay. Like, um, so we were left with some questions. Um, I did a lot more deep diving into the answers, and I'm glad I did because I found out some more things. Do you want, can we bring it up screen actually? Yes. So it was um, page 89 and in the book, in my printed copy, but I know that's not the same thing as yours. I'm sorry, is this motor vehicle? Uh, engineering. 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 Yeah. So we were left with, if I remember, two questions. One was about the mobility improvements. And what it turned out after lots of math for Julie and Mike is that Mike had actually just misspoke <laughs> and that those engineering improvements are actually not the ones that were in the override plan in 2019. Money in the override plan in 2019 is 200000 in the capital fund and 50000 to um, Help with additional transportation for seniors, and it isn't going up 13 percent. And you can definitely make that case. And I, I, I conveyed that some people were interested in not going up 13 percent, but it's actually not this amount. Mike did say that, but it's not this amount. Though is um, uh, there's a couple of things that have happened in the last few years. Um, um, some bike racks. Um, there was uh, fixing bricks in Arlington Heights. There's a pedestrian beacon that was added. So it's things like that. So, and those are actually things that Mike has control of. So when he originally talked, he talked to us, it, you know, we talked about a lot of things. I'm not, <laughs> you know, he knows his stuff really well, but it was just sort of a confusion that we got. Uh, the second thing uh, that I did a deep dive into, which is really interesting, is the money that we saw in the actuals being much higher than the budget amount. 
he, I never thought anyone's doing anything wrong, but I just didn't understand it. And so here's what the story is, is. The amount that's budgeted is the amount that they expect to contract out for things like serving and mapping and stuff that the engineering department usually does. They don't want to raise that budget amount because that's, you know, that's the money that they need. They also don't fully want to put the actual spending in the actual budget because that feels misleading to them because the actual spending that bump that we saw was money left over from other departments that was repurposed to really, you know, to projects that are in the back background. Because one of the interesting things about, about DBW is it is a department that has multiple different divisions. So most budgets don't have that. And it's a budget where Mike has a discretion to move things around and to zero out the budget. So most budgets, you can't do this. But there's like a couple of budgets that have divisions where you can shift things around. What I've asked for in the future is a list of that sort of money that's spent on those extra projects in the budget explainer, which Julie thought was a good idea. Basically, she, her position is, we definitely want to present. We're not hiding anything. We give you the actual. We're not hiding anything. But we want to present it in a way that's not misleading. And we were trying to do that here. So, um, so I, I don't know if I can read if that is, is clear. Clear. Yeah. Clear? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm gonna I'm would like to recommend um, the approval of budget as presented. Second. All right. Any further discussion? Questions? All right. Let's take a vote. All in favor of the engineering budget as um, presented in the in the budget book? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? I didn't abstain because I wasn't. Okay, so everyone who uh, in favor, raise your hands. Fifteen, fifteen, four, zero against one abstention. Right. Let's do that again. All in favor? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sixteen in favor, zero opposed, and one abstention. Yep, first rule seventeen. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, um, Jennifer. Um, all right. So we'll pick up. Um, we'll do the rest of the DPW and facilities budget on Monday. Hopefully, um, who else is coming in on Monday? Um, so first at seven thirty is the. Um, Commission on Disability, and then at eight is the Historic Districts Commission, and the other uh, historic commission that whose name I can't remember. They never got back to us in time, so I did tell them that we would be voting to level fund them. Okay. All right, for Disability Commission, there was a question I asked him to reach out to you, but. Someone on the commission was asking whether it would could be remote or hybrid because it's somebody from the disability commission, but I don't know. They told him to reach out to you, so I don't know if that person. I haven't be. gotten anything yet from him, so that would be. They were asking about the building and access, so yeah. I don't know. We I mean, we have the ability to do hybrid, don't we? But well, well, so, well, who will get in touch with us? Or I asked him, our the eighty-eight town's eighty-eight coordinator, who is presenting along with mission members to reach out to Tara if he needs it. Okay. He has not at this follow point. up with them or not. Okay. I, I reached out to him just a while ago to remind him to send the materials by tomorrow. So maybe right. that will so start we'll try them. to touch base one okay. or the other. Yeah. Um, I just I because I need to if I need to post the budget by seven o'clock tomorrow, which I prefer to do a little earlier, then so I'll reach out to him and try to because we we need to put whether it's remote or yeah. hybrid right. or whatever. It, it will be, we'll, we'll be meeting here, whether yeah. we enable someone else to, to, to join, we'll do that, but we'll be meeting here, both on uh, Monday and Wednesday. Okay. All right, motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.